So in order to save time, I hope it's okay that I conduct this in Icelandic. No, not really. Um, is this the one I'm going to use? So when Andy asked me to talk, I, um, I decided that I would name the presentation What's Love Got To Do With It? And I'm not going to sing a Tina Turner song. Um, but I thought this was most, the most important thing I might talk about. And yesterday I heard Daniel saying that he had been praying that um, Andy would not use the verse he was going to use. And his, answers, uh, his prayers were answered. Um, I feel that I've heard my presentation over and over again these past few days. So uh, I'm, I'm not that good at prayer, obviously. Um, so this is all wrong here. Oh, there you go. There you go. No, there you don't. Being a man, I can only think of one thing at a time. So there's not much going on right here now. Um, and I feel the cortisol level is rising. So maybe someone needs to come up here and hug me to get me some oxytocin. Um, well, what makes for a good doctor? Studies have shown that patients, they want the doctors to be knowledgeable and they want them to be skillful. And um, this is what we evaluate for years when people, when, when we go through medical school or when you go through university to become a physiotherapist or uh, occupational therapist or nurse or whatever. We are measured and evaluated and devalued by our skills and knowledge. But there is more that the patients want. And if you are a healthcare professional or a lay person working in health ministries, this goes for you as well. What patients want just as much is compassion and caring. Um, <clears throat> so here's a good doctor. She seems to be very compassionate and caring. And uh, hopefully she's skillful. She at least knows where to put the stethoscope. <laughs> I want to read to you a quote from Maya Angelou, the famous African-American poet. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And there's some truth in that. What is love? We can go through dictionaries. We can read how we describe love. Um, I came across a very nice quote in Mervyn Maxwell's book, God Cares. I don't know if you have these books or know them, but these are books he wrote on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And in the preface, he said, to be loved is to be treated with kindness, to be thought about and planned for, to be wept over and rejoiced with, to be talked to and listened to, to have nice things done for us, to be loved is to have someone truly care about us. And I think this is, this is a very good quote. Love is a necessity. 
from the time we're born. We need love. Love is not just a luxury thing that we can provide when we've done all else. But it's a necessity from the very beginning. Children need love when they're zero years old, when they're two years old, five years old, nine, 99. We still need it. And from early start, we develop empathy and compassion. And you can see this mother in the picture. She's playing peek-a-boo with the child. And this game that we think is maybe a little bit silly, I mean, mommy isn't here, mommy is here, all that. I mean, we know mommy is there, isn't she? But they don't. But the thing is, they're learning that mommy will be there. And this leads to them trusting. I can't see you, but now I can. And that leads to trust. In these years, the brain is developing very fast. It goes through neuroptic, uh, synaptic um, repruning. We're losing connections. We're strengthening connections that we need, and so on. And the mirror cells that you may have heard of, they're probably the most active in the early years. And the mirror cells, they seem to be mainly focusing on motoric activity. So, you know, when you have a child and you go like this, what does the child do? It goes like this. And you go like this, and the child goes like this. And this can be fun for 15 minutes or so, um, at least for me. I have a rather immature sense of humor. So, but it's very important because the child is learning. The child is learning in a way how you feel when you look like this. Empathy is the sharing of suffering. And this guy over here says, I know exactly how you feel. And, and that's obvious, he has an arrow in his behind as well, so he should. But when studies were done on empathy early on, they were mainly focusing on physical pain. And we know from these studies that people that are empathetic towards others, they have the same areas in the brain lighting up as the sensory areas in the brain of the sufferer. So, even though you don't have any injury on your body, your brain is reacting in the same way as if you did. And this is very important, because we understand how we feel one another. We, we, we are with you. But we also have emotional empathy, which enables us to share the emotions of others. And we call it, call it empathic resonance, when we can feel what emotions other people have around us. But sometimes, feeling others' bad emotions can lead to empathic distress, which means that you all of a sudden feel bad. And the thing with empathy is that you don't always distinguish between you and the other. So you may have a feeling that you don't even understand where it comes from. So, this can lead to, and empathy all alone can be very self-related. I feel bad. Even though I don't understand why, I feel bad. And this can lead to withdrawal from a situation, being with a sufferer, having these empathic feelings may lead to me leaving the situation. And sometimes, when we don't distinguish properly between my or our own emotions and others' emotions, it can lead to worse health and even be a part of burnout. And we can see that people with burnout, one of the main symptoms of burnout is what is called depersonalization, which I, I think is a wrong word, um, also called cynicism, that we tend to withdraw from others, we don't care. And I think 
We have an epidemic of that today. A lot of people are dealing with these issues. But there's more to these things. There's also what we call cognitive empathy. That is the ability to understand how other people are thinking. The ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes. So we can, you know, we can realize why they feel the way they feel. And this guy, he isn't really, you know, he isn't getting it. Um, maybe that's why he's a pirate. But we call it theory of mind as well. The ability to understand that other people dif think differently than we do. Now, these two things, the cognitive empathy and the emotional empathy, are very important because that enables us to understand other people better and we might become compassionate. And that's the positive side of empathy. Compassion, there we have more other related emotions. We are not focusing on ourselves and our bad feelings at the moment. We feel warmth towards the sufferer. We feel concern to, for, towards the sufferer. And we care for improving the other's well-being. And that's maybe the main issue. It's not just how I feel, but it's the action that follows. We want to make your life better. And it's a pro-social motivation. And it seems that people that have more compassion have better health as well. And here we can see, it's always a little bit fancy to have pictures of brains, isn't it? I mean, it, it gives it more weight. I, 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 I feel that way. Um, you see, that these things, the theory of mind, the green dot here, and the compassion and the empathy for the suffering, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, they are spread around the brain in different areas. But what they have in common is the frontal cortex and the cingulate gyrus. But different areas in these places. And just to put it up here, compassion and empathy, they are what we call socio-affective processes. And theory of mind is associated with cognitive processes. And here, these two, the compassion and the theory of mind, are self-other distinction. You know, they're, they're this self-other distinction is clear, which it not necessarily is an empathy. So emotional health means all of these things need to be intact. Interpersonal Emotion regulation is the thing when you meet a suffering person and you, by being there, connect with them on an emotional level and you make them feel better by being. And this is very important because when we work with people, I know how it is being a doctor in a very stressful situation. Take an ER situation, for instance. Everybody that comes into the ER, they are anxious. They don't suffer from anxiety disorder, but they are anxious and they are stressed. Because they have some symptoms that they don't know what will lead to. Just a month ago, I woke up one morning, I was in Denmark, and my eyelid was swollen and is not what you want to see when you wake up in a hotel, that your eyelid is just <laughs> I didn't feel very well about it, you know. I had no clue what was going on with my eyelid. I'm a psychiatrist for crying out loud. How should I know? So the day after, when I arrived in Iceland, I went to my GP, which I have never done before, because I'm a doctor, you, you, know, you don't go to a doctor especially if you have some psychiatric disorders. <laughs> and you're laughing. <laughs> Come on. Actually, 
I attended a very brave lecture just before, and I want to thank Haiti for that presentation. Thank you. I am actually one of the 55%. But, another fancy picture of brains. The target is the patient suffering, which leads to a certain emotion within the doctor or anyone else who is helping the person, which again leads to calming effect from a calmer individual. If this one does not have the compassion in order, or does not have a clear self or the distinction, they may not be helpful. I know of patients that have gone to a doctor and they told them the traumatic experience they'd had and the doctor started crying. And the patient said, I mean, she's nice, but I'm never going there again. It, it didn't help me. I know she hurt me, but it didn't help me in any way. You are your patient's anti-anxiety medicine by being, by encouraging, by calming. Can this be learned? I, I, I'm sorry, another example of my immature um, sense of humor. Um, the doctor stands there pulling his pants down and said, it helps me empathize. It just, um, it makes me easier to understand how you are doing. Can this be learned? Yes. There have been studies done on residents. And there is, um, they, they got empathic training. And the training was consisting of three sessions, not very long, where they were taught about the physiology and biology and neurology behind empathy and all these things. And they were, um, during this time, they talked to patients that evaluated them. And they got a higher score than the control group after these trainings. And the interesting thing is that you could see an increased activity in the anterior insula and the um, anterior medial uh, cingulate cortex. But there was also an increase in self-reported negative affect. I think I have to change my head. No, well, well let's try it. I'll just move like this. Then, the same individuals, they con got compassion training. And they may be, um, there may be different uh, compassion trainings existing. But what happened with these individuals was, was that you could see an increase in the medial orbitofrontal cortex and the striatum. And at the same time, there was a decrease in negative affect and an increase in positive affect. They felt better themselves. And one of the ways people have trained compassion is by visualization. You visualize the person that you feel very compassionate towards. And then you transfer these emotions you have in your mind to a person that is a bit further away from you. And in the end, you transfer it to a person that you actually resent. Imagine if our focus was constantly on someone specific. What would that do to our compassion? Paul says in Hebrews, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings us closely and let us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Looking to Jesus. 
Paul continues in, well, it doesn't continue actually, but he also says in Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I do not stand here as the perfection of these things. I have been an inconsiderate doctor to some of my patients on a bad day. I've been uncompassionate when I should have been compassionate. But I do believe that this is true. And this is the truth, focusing on him. Ellen White wrote this. Do not keep your mind fixed on the defective example of professing Christians. You will, of course, see in their lives things that are not right. But if you keep looking at their faults, you will become like them. What we look at, we become. Instead of looking at the lives of your fellow men, look to Jesus. There you will see no imperfection, but perfection, righteousness, goodness, mercy, and truth. Take the Savior as, you, as your example in all things. And who is he, is he writing to? A young doctor who had just started. She could have written it to me 20 odd years ago. 20, yeah, well, don't want to think about that. Being caring and compassionate promotes health. As I said, fear and grief accompany most of our patients' symptoms. But caring communication style has positive impact on patients' health, illness behaviors, and satisfaction with care. So it matters how we treat people. And this can be measured in studies. And I found this very interesting, feeling felt, not being heard, but feeling felt is important to patients. And good history taking can relieve some of the patient's distress. Just a month ago, one of my patients came to me and she told me about her problems over the last few weeks. She had got gallstones and she went to the hospital and what was most interesting to me was they treated her properly, they were skillful, they knew exactly what to do, but she never felt felt. She never was sure whether they had really heard what she had told them, because it was so stressful. She still felt bad, even though she had been treated and there was nothing wrong with her. So feeling felt is important. The experience of being cared for lowers stress hormone, just like when all the people came here and ordered these things for me. It, it, the cortisol level went down. And it leads to neuroendocrine homeostasis. And here's what I find very interesting. Being caring and compassionate is not just a humane adjunct to biomedical treatment, but it may be a biomedical intervention in itself. So when you take time for being caring and compassionate to those who come to your health expo, come to your clinic, you're treating them. It's not a waste of time. You are establishing their better health. 
in all of these thoughts, I came across an interesting article about leadership styles and very fast, I'm going to go through this. They said you have different leadership styles and one of them is the leadership of a powerful leader. Not just because he wants to have all the power, but he thinks he has to. And it leads to a stressful situation for the leader. And it leads to an arousal of power needs and in being in this leadership position. And to power stress, this desire and need to have impact on others, an obligation to influence them. And it leads to lowering of the parasympathetic nervous system activity, heightens the HPA axis and cortisol level, increases the sympathetic nervous system activity, which leads to high blood pressure, high cortisol, and lower immune function. And this is just the biology we know exists. Then I said, what about a compassion coaching leadership, where you are at the same level with the person you're dealing with, but you are compassionate and you want to understand the person, and you want to care for the person, and initiate some action contributing to the well-being. And when I read it, I thought to myself, they're talking about discipleship, aren't they? This is discipleship. You spend a lot of time with few people and you really care for them. And you try to help them the best you can. And it took me to another thought. I'm also discipling my patients. I'm teaching them about healthy living because I want to help them. I know of some of my colleagues that just tell their patients, you do what I tell you or you just find another doctor. I'm not going to be responsible for this. And it takes away my burden when I think about it this way. I'm not responsible for my patients' decisions. I just tell them what I think is best. because I care for them. And it leads to increase in oxytocin and vasopressin, higher parasympathetic nervous system uh, activity, better immune function, and so on and so forth. So by being caring and compassionate, you're not just treating your patient, you're also increasing your own health. Better health. So it's a win-win. Ellen White wrote, the work which the disciples did, we also are to do. Every Christian is to be a missionary. In sympathy and compassion, we are to minister to those in need of help, seeking with unselfish earnestness to lighten the woes of suffering humanity. We heard this this morning. And I have to admit, I don't know of any better description of love than this. And I would like to emphasize the things that love is, not the ones love isn't, but love is patient and kind. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. Imagine that. Love believes all things. Isn't that paradoxical? Isn't this an oxymoron for us? Love believes all things? It reminds me of the first time I was at the psychiatric unit as a medical student. And I was following an older psychiatrist with decades of experience, and therein came a psychotic lady with these fantastic delusions, absolutely ridiculous. And she told him about her delusions, and he just nodded and said, wow, that must be terrible. And I thought to myself, why isn't he correcting her? Later I obviously realized that he was building a relationship because he was caring for her. Because love 
believes all things. It hopes all things and endures all things. I want to end with a poem by Maya Angelou. And by now you may have realized that I find her poetry, well, it appeals to me. And this poem goes like this. It's called Touched by an Angel. We, unaccustomed to courage, exiles from delight, live coiled in shells of loneliness until love leaves its high holy temple and comes into our sight to liberate us into life. Love arrives, and in its train come ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet, if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity in the flush of love's light. We dare be brave, and suddenly we see that love costs all we are and will ever be. Yet, it is only love which sets us free. Dare to be brave, to love your patience. Thank you.